Hello, welcome to Sonography Radiology Training Channel. This series of videos is a scientific presentation about fetal solitary sound. This is the eighth video in this video series about cerebral ventriculomegaly part one. What is the outlines of this presentation? The first one, we will see introduction and incidence of ventriculomegaly, ultrasound imaging technique and appearance of ventriculomegaly, the pitfalls and mimics that may be encountered in fetus ultrasound and teaching cases. Also, we can see rule of fetal MRI, prognosis, management of ventriculomegaly, and final teaching points. We will see these items in video part 1 and the others in video part 2. Now, we will begin with introduction and incidence. Enlargement of lateral cerebral ventricles commonly referred to as ventriculomegaly, which is a non-specific marker of abnormal brain development. The incidence of ventriculomegaly during pregnancy is less than 1% or 1 to 2 cases per 1,000 births. It's the most common CNS anomaly identified by prenatal sonography. About 70 to 85% of cases with ventriculomegaly have associated anomalies. Lateral ventricular enlargement represent the tip of the iceberg in fetal CNS imaging as it is sensitive for detection of a wide variety of fetal CNS abnormalities. Ventriculomegaly is usually due to increased intracranial pressure secondary to obstruction of CSFLO, in which case the site and etiology may be demonstrated on fetus ultrasound. Sound. Ventriculomegaly is associated with male sex, intrauterine infection, and increased risk of trisomies 21 and 18, CNS abnormalities including vermian defects, agenesis and dysgenesis of corpus callosum, and spina bifida. Detection of ventriculomegaly should prompt a detailed search to determine whether this finding is bilateral or unilateral, mild, moderate or severe, isolated, that is to say, without visualization of other structural anomalies including findings of neural tube defect or it may be non-isolated. Ventriculomegaly is usually attributed to a multifactorial pattern of inheritance. However, the detection of it in a male fetus should prompt both correlation with maternal history of prior pregnancies with hydrocephalus as well as focus ultrasound for findings of X-linked hydrocephalus. The sonographic findings of X-linked hydrocephalus include ventriculomegaly secondary to stenosis of the aqueduct of Sylvius, macrocephaly, genesis of corpus callosum, and adduction of the thumb. This diagnosis represents 5% of all cases of genetic hydrocephalus is associated with up to 50% of recurrence among subsequent male fetuses. Severe and moderate ventriculomegaly are associated with a higher risk of prenatal or neonatal death and poor neurologic outcome. In isolated mild ventriculomegaly, the ventricle may stabilize or return to normal size, however, there is a risk of neurologic sequelae, especially in the setting of progression. Fetal karyotyping, genetic counseling, and fetal MRI can often provide additional contributory or confirmatory information. What is the ultrasound imaging technique and appearance of ventriculomegaly? By definition, ventriculomegaly is measurement of the lateral ventricle atrium greater than 10 mm. Outcomes are correlated with further subdivision of the degree of lateral ventricle dilation 
into the following mild means 10 to 12 millimeter moderate 12 to 15 and severe more than 15 millimeter the most sensitive location for the detection of a true ventriculomegaly is at the level of the atria this is because the lateral ventricle atrial diameter remains relatively stable at less than 10 millimeter throughout gestation whereas other areas of ventricle may evolve imaging of the atria should be performed in the axial plane at the level of the thalamus with the lateral ventricle horizontally aligned so that the atrial walls are perpendicular to the direction of the beam with good resultant specular reflection. The medial atrial wall is a better specular reflector than the lateral wall and is contiguous with the parietal occipital fissure. The lateral atrial wall is demarcated by the glomus of the choroid plexus which usually rests against the dependent wall thereby providing a marker of lateral atrial boundary of the far field ventricle. In an attempt to decrease possible technical deficiencies, it has been further suggested that axial view should be strictly assessed by demonstrating that the proximal and distal calvarial margins are equidistant, that anterior landmarks include the cavum septi plosidae or fernix and posterior landmark, the fluid field reshape of the ambient cistern. Mild ventriculomegaly can also be diagnosed when there is separation of the choroid plexus from the medial wall of the lateral ventricle measuring greater than 3 mm. The dangling choroid plexus sign refers to the downward position of the choroid plexus toward the gravity dependent wall in an enlarged lateral ventricle atrium. Detection of this sign or when the glomus fills less than 60% of the atrium should prompt careful evaluation of ventriculomegaly through correct measurement in the axial plane. If it's not possible to obtain a correct measurement of the ventricles in the axial plane, then the ventricles can be measured in the coronal plane at the level of the atria by positioning the caliper at the inner edges of the ventricular walls. Care should be taken when the diagnosis of ventriculomegaly is suspected because this condition is erroneously diagnosed in up to 13% of normal ventricles opening to off-axis image plane, angled measurement, or improper choice of ventricular boundary. Although diagnosis of lateral ventriculomegaly is extremely important, important, the third and fourth ventricles should also be closely assessed as they may provide clues to the underlying diagnosis. Enlarged third and fourth ventricles are documented when the transverse dimensions are equal or more than 3.5 for third and 4.8 mm for fourth ventricle. This axial ultrasound image of fetal head at 19 weeks shows the third ventricle as a single echogenic line between the Ptolemy. And another image at 13 weeks shows the configuration of the third ventricle as parallel echogenic lines. But this axial image at 29 weeks shows the V-shaped configuration of third ventricle. And the electronic calipels have been positioned on the walls of the ventricle to measure its maximum diameter. And if its diameter is equal or more than 3.5 mm, it should be considered as ventriculomegaly. These axial, sagittal, and coronal images show the shape of first ventricle in different planes. As we can see in this axial plane, the shape of the first ventricle like this, in sagittal like this image, and in coronal like that one. Here is the roof of the ventricle and here is the floor. In sagittal, the roof is here and floor here. In coronal view, the roof here and the floor of the ventricle is 
here. If in the axial image the transverse diameter of the first ventricle equal or more than 4.8 mm, it could be considered as ventriculomegaly. Now we can see a few teaching cases. Sagittal ultrasound image in a fetus with aqueductal stenosis. As we can see, severe lateral ventriculomegaly. Also, the third ventricle is mildly enlarged and first ventricle is normal. Case 2. This axial scan at the level of the atria demonstrate isolated mild right ventriculomegaly. The carotid plexus dangles in about the lateral atrial wall. In addition to ventricular measurement of 1 cm, there is a 7 mm gap between the medial ventricle wall and the normal carotid plexus. This coronal image from the same patients confirms a symmetric dilation of right ventricle relative to the left. The normal cavum septum placidum is visualized in the midline. Sagittal images of the bilateral ventricles demonstrate mild irregularity of the right germinal matrix relative to the smooth contour of the left. The irregularity corresponds to grade 1 hemorrhage, which is the most likely etiology of mild right ventricular Megali. Another case, axial image demonstrates severe bilateral ventriculomegaly. The crate plexus falls against the dependent wall of the non-dependent left ventricle and appears atrophic relative to the degree of ventricular dilation. There is marked thinning of the posterior cerebral cortex. In addition to severe bilateral ventriculomegaly, the third ventricle is dilated, measuring about 5 mm. In constellation, these findings are most reflective of aqueductal stenosis. Case 4. Axial image at the level of the thalami demonstrate isolated moderate right ventriculomegaly. The echogenic choroid plexus falls and dangles against the lateral ventricle wall. In coronal image from the same patient confirms asymmetric dilation of the right ventricle relative to the left. The normal cavum septum placidum is visualized in the midline. Sagittal image demonstrates a heterogeneous echogenic mass expanding the right ventricle with minimal internal fluid. These findings are reflective of intraventricular hemorrhage similar to case 1, which is the etiology of the unilateral ventriculomegaly. Now, the pitfall and mimics for ventriculomegaly in fetus ultrasound. The first one is pseudohydrocephalus, parencephalic cyst, and and other artifacts. The first one is pseudohydrocephalus. Pseudohydrocephalus, a common mimic of ventriculomegaly, is due to artifact that causes the normal senolucent brain surrounding the ventricle in the far field to be miscontoured as CSF. This axial image demonstrates apparent ventriculomegaly characterized by echogenic lines within the senolucent brain, but the normal choroid plexus and thalamus are not visualized on this image. By turning the transducer slightly in the plane of thalamus now reveals the clones of choroid plexus and the echogenic ventricular walls which are not dilated and the ventricle is normal. This occurs when the time gain compensation is set for examining the fetal torso and then moved to the head, resulting in low signal amplification. This pitfall can be avoided by recognition of the hyperechogenic choroid plexus within the true ventricle, demarcating the lateral ventricular wall on an axial view with a slight coded tilt. Another pitfall is parencephalic cyst. Pseudohydrocephalus, a less frequently encountered diagnosis, reflects a cystic space or parencephalic cyst always within the brain parenchyma. This cyst is believed to be due to either primary failure of neuronal development or more often to secondary cortical loss from an external insult. 
pseudohydrocephalus should be a diagnostic consideration for unilateral severe ventriculomegaly, particularly in the setting of the midline shift. This axial image demonstrates severe prencephaly of the cerebral cortex with leftward midline shift and no visualized right lateral ventricular wall. This axial scan after changing the fetal position demonstrates a dangling left choroid plexus falling against the dependent lateral wall posteriorly and cortical loss anteriorly. These cysts communicate directly with an enlarged ventricle through ex vacuo phenomenon. Hydrocephalus ex vacuo, also known as compensatory enlargement of the CSF spaces, is a term used to describe the increase in the volume of CSF characterized on images as an enlargement of cerebral ventricle and subarachnoid spaces caused by encephalic volume loss. The size of this cyst at detection is variable and they frequently enlarge on follow-up, potentially resulting in mass effect on adjacent structures. Other artifacts for ventriculomegaly. Occasionally, the cavum verge, which is the posterior extension of cavum septum placidum and rarely a cavum vellum interpositum cyst, can be miscontrolled as dilation of the third ventricle. Another teaching cases, a 34-year-old woman referred for intracranial midline mass at 33 weeks gestation. Axial image demonstrate a normal cavum septum placidum. Rotating the transducer slightly reveals the cavum verge, which is the posterior extension of CSP. This sagittal image reveals a normal corpus callosum from the geno anteriorly to the splenium posteriorly. The CSP is visualized anteriorly and the cavum verge posteriorly. Another case, 33-year-old woman referred for an intracranial cyst at 34 weeks gestation. Axial image demonstrate a midline cystic structure corresponding to a cavum velamentum interpositum cyst, which is an anatomic variant. The non-dilated ventricular atria are partially visualized. The coronal image demonstrate cavum velamentum interpositum cyst in the midline posteriorly with no ventricular dilation. Sagittal image reveals a normal corpus callosum from geno anteriorly to the spalanium posteriorly. The normal CSP is visualized anteriorly and the cavum filamentum interpositum cyst is visualized posteriorly outlined by thin walls. This pitfall can be avoided by direct visualization of these normal fetal structures in their expected location on both the coronal and sagittal planes. In this video, we review these items and we will see these items in video part 2 in the future, of course, with God willing. Now, I suggest two others of my videos that are close to this video in terms of matters. Thank you for your attention.